just looking at, um, at, the, at the century, we've got a population that's going to get to 10 billion by 2050. Um, we're wasting 40% 40 40 of the food we produce is never eaten, and we have almost a billion people going hungry every single day. 40% is wasted? Yes. Sasha, thanks for joining me on the podcast today. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So, you are the founder of Olio, a leading food and item sharing app, which I've used. It's a great platform, and it was really good to declutter my house and, um, and help people that, that, that need those things, which I was just wasting, to, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. So, you've grown this just from an idea yeah. into now 7 million plus users. So what advice would you give to other people that are looking to start a tech company? Because you've gone through that journey of raising money, of building something amazing. What tips would you give to, I guess, the version of yourself right at the beginning of that journey? That's a good question. Um, we're now, um, I've got a co-founder, and we are now almost to the day, I don't know what day it is, um, nine years to when we launched. Wow. Um, so we're in our 10th year. Yeah. So it's been quite the journey. Um, and a lot of things have changed in the external environment. So some of the advice that I would give now is relevant to today's like macroeconomic environment. Okay. But um, a couple of things spring to mind. One, make sure that I, I think what's really helped us to sort of stay alive and thrive over the last 10 years is that we're solving a really big problem. Mm. And the problem of food waste and waste in general is absolutely enormous, you know, in the trillions of dollars. Yeah. So. Um, where there's a big problem, there's a big opportunity, and that makes it a lot easier to convince investors, employees, um, that what you're doing is meaningful, that there's potential for big return, um, and, to, uh, and, and to take them on that journey with you. So I think solving a big problem, as opposed to something that's quite niche, can be quite beneficial, mm -hmm. even if it's overwhelming, if it feels overwhelming. Um, I think in hindsight, we Tessa and I would have both, at the time, we were in a build it, monetize it later uh, environment. Mm -hmm. Just get really big and once you're at scale, there's lots of ways, proven ways to monetize things. Awesome. You can figure it out then. Um, I don't think, I'm not quite sure that you'd be able to raise the capital that we were able to raise um, and go as long as we did without monetizing in today's environment. So definitely my recommendation would be to be thinking about just basic business fundamentals, unit economics um, from the very beginning because mm -hmm. it's necessary to be able to um, be I just a lot more wise about what that stra your strategy is around that than we were. We were, qu we were quite ignorant and that was fine at the time, but it wouldn't fly now. Sure, yeah. You know, getting to profitability seemed to be less important a couple of years ago, um, but now it's like first and foremost on every investor's mind, right? It is, yeah. Yeah. So I guess um, background wise, you've had a very, very interesting journey to get to where you are today, right? So you went from growing up in a self-described hippie, vegetarian, no vaccinations environment to spending 13 years working in investment banking and, and management consulting. Yeah. So very different types of experiences to a lot of people. Yeah. What, what did you learn from, I guess, like those varied experiences, which you then applied to the world of being a startup founder? I definitely had a very alternative upbringing is often how I described it or will describe it. Um, and it was also an environment without a lot of money. So my parents were entrepreneurs and, um, but- In the food sector as well. In the natural foods industry, yeah. yeah. Um, but it wasn't, and they started a cooperative. Um, it took a long time for that business. It wasn't until I was a teenager that that business was sort of self-sustaining. I mean, because it was a cooperative, it was never, you know, a huge money maker. Yeah. Um, although we were part of a really like lovely and passionate community. And that's definitely where I got my um, care and love for the environment sort of instilled, instilled in me from. But the nature of my childhood as the oldest of six, without a lot of money, it just felt really chaotic to me. Um, and I definitely spent a lot, of, a lot of my childhood plotting how I was gonna have a much more, um, I guess, normal sure. adulthood. And that was the driver behind studying hard, you know, pursuing, being very academic, you know, pursuing degrees in you know, economics and business, and also career path in what I would consider to be relatively safe industries high paying industries of investment banking and consulting. Um, and it, it took me a decade to, to sort of get that sense of security that comes from um, having a CV that's relatively bulletproof, feeling like I could be lose my job and get a new job yeah, yeah. with confidence. Um, and before I sort of began to shed some of that just real financial insecurity that I was raised with. Mm. Um, 
so I guess the question is, so that, that's sort of why the, those, those two extremes of my sort of childhood and then my sort of early part of my career, um, how those came about, because I, I was actively seeking something that was different than, than, than what I was raised with. Was that challenging? Because I, I, I heard that your, your, your poor mum cried when you got your job in investment banking, for example. Yes, my mom, uh, my mom, very unique um, individual. Um, and very, very counterculture. And, you know, she did not see much value at all. And sort of, it's not that she didn't understand what I was doing. She just had a hard time understanding why I would want to sure. spend my sort of rare and precious time on this planet just making money for other people. Um, and, um, but, but on the, oh, I, I mean, I could go into the psychology of my parents for a long time and it probably wouldn't be relevant to your audience. Um, but you asked me to tie it back to something that I've forgotten. So I, I guess like, so the... The, this, growing up, the environment it taught you about the, looking after the environment, you know, why it's important to do good for the world, why it's important to add value. But then you learned the business side from the consulting career and the, and the banking career. So I guess applying the two is like the perfect recipe to, to build a company. You, know, you understand the mechanisms of how to start, scale, and hopefully one day exit a, a business. And then at the same time, you are doing it for good. You're doing it to benefit the world. You're doing it to make the world a better place. I, I don't think actually in a practical sense, the experience that I got from working in banking and consulting and strategy and business development roles really um, sort of helped me build a business from the ground up, if I'm honest. Okay. Um, but what it, did, what it does do is it, it gives you a sense of credibility, yeah. which you can then bring in, and it gives you the skills to organize information, um, solve problems, um, present ideas such that when you have a vision for something that you want to bring into the world, a startup, if I was able to present it in such a way that um, probably got me cut through with, for example, in a fundraising environment. And those are just sort of, sort of core skills um, that, you know, I think actually it's just fundamental skills that you could, you know, using spreadsheets, forecasting, making presentations, you know, structuring information, those skills are really helpful in any, for, in, in any career, um, startup or otherwise. So I think that was, that's probably how it helped. Yeah. Um, I'm grateful that I'm working on a startup that's solving a big, meaningful problem that can you know, help make the world a better place. Not only does it mean that when I get up in the morning, I'm inspired to keep going, even when things are feeling a bit gloomy, yeah. um, because there's real people, real impact that um, you know, I'm personally, my team's personally re delivering. Um, but also it makes hiring easier, it makes getting sort of press and media um, attention easier, it makes everything just a bit easier when you're doing something that is, um, you know, the, that the world sort of just wants to see. Yeah, no, absolutely. And when you're building this, you did an interview during uh, London Tech Week recently, and you talked about the power of just saying yes to opportunities. Um, and I think you used the example of when you were building a partnership with Tesco as, as uh, the example behind that. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, why is it important that entrepreneurs say yes and yes to, to, to more opportunities, even if they don't know where they're going to lead to, if, if that makes sense? I think, um, I think what I was trying to say is Tesco basically, we did a proof of concept with them, and then they asked us to roll out sort of nationally across their estate. And we were absolutely not in a position to deliver against that. We didn't know how we were going to do it. But the reason we had to say yes is because opportunities like that just don't come along very often. And it's almost impossible to predict, especially in enterprise sales, when you're going to get the green light. Um, you know, we recently launched with the number two retailer um, in the UK, and that was a six year long conversation. Wow. But we rolled out nationally over six weeks. It's a long sales Whereas, cycle. Yeah, so it really depends. There's so many. Um, there's so many variables in enterprise sales that when someone says, can you do something, um, you just need to say yes, and then you just got to figure it, figure it out. Um, and I mean, I, I think anyone who's building a business couldn't imagine saying no when, you know, such a massive opportunity lands on the doorstep. Hey, this podcast is brought to you by weloveAlpha.com. If you're looking to grow and hire and scale your software, engineering team in the UK and go to weloveAlpha.com to hire the best software developers on the market. Everything across Java to C Sharp to PHP to Python to React and Angular and mobile and more. Go to weloveAlpha.com to hire the best software engineers in the UK now. Sure. So you've raised, I want to say more than 50 million? I think that's in dollars. In, in pounds, in dollars, I think yeah. it's 43 million pounds. Okay, okay. Yeah. In, in dollars, 
50 million, nice it round. Always, it sounds higher in dollars, round, so that's round why you number. always PR it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, to help build, build your platform. So a lot of entrepreneurs that we speak to, they, they're struggling to raise the first dollar, never mind 50 million. Oh. So what, what tips would you give to people that are looking to fundraise? Again, we, you know, we did raise all of that funding, sort of 2021 and, pr and prior, mm -hmm. which was a zero interest rate environment, sure. and there was a lot of extra capital around. Um, things have changed since then. I've actually become an angel investor since then, although for anyone who's listening, I've stopped now. So happy to look at decks, but I'm not making investments right now. Um, and I think, again, it comes back to what I was saying earlier. You, investors are looking for something different right now. They're looking for sound business fundamentals. They want to understand that they want to make sure that they want to know that you understand how when you invest money at the top of whatever acquisition funnel you're um, your company has that you will then get um, a payback um, more than your cost of acquisition within a reasonable payback period. Yeah. And so being able to demonstrate that and that you've got growth engines to, in order to be able to scale um, cost effectively your acquisition channels, I think it really comes down to just business fundamentals. That said, um, if you're still looking to just get your first dollar, a lot of it comes down to, I mean, it's probably 98% still just being able to effectively explain your vision and get people excited about it, which means rehearsing until you can, until you can p p present your idea um, and pitch it in such a way that you, you, know, you seduce everyone you're talking to um, so that they get equally excited about what you're doing and then you can reassure them that you've got all the business fundamentals, uh, uh, but at that point they're emotionally invested in you and the problem you're trying to solve. So practice, 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 and um, like, I guess, make sure you've got a really, really awesome pitch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, love I, the, I don't know what else to say, to well, be honest. Well, it hasn't changed that much. No, I mean, like, the fundamentals are the fundamentals, right? And I like what you mentioned around the emotional side, because people often try to persuade people with logic, but in reality, that the way to do it is persuade them with emotion and then back it up with, with logic yes, to get them locked in. That's what you said. Yeah. <laughs> um, you live by the rule ABF, always be fundraising. Yes. Why is that important to you? Um, well, it's more of a rule that my co-founder um, created. Um, and she, as the CEO, I'm the COO, she sort of takes the lead on investor liaisons. Um, that's just a necessity, quite frankly. Like we, if, you're, if you're not always fundraising, um, I, I find it... Uh, we are quite relatively conservative when we think about runway and we think about the sort of financial position of the company, we never want to leave anything. Like what we're trying to do is too important. We have a team, a, a large team of people and their families um, who rely, you know, rely on us making sound business decisions. And so we're always thinking, you know, two, three years ahead from a fundraising perspective at each round, what are the different metrics um, that are considered um, sort of the, the rules of thumb around how much you need to be earning, um, what type of or marketplace, what type of marketplace health metrics we need to be demonstrating. And so we're, for, we sort of plan out by round funding and metrics um, and also who are the potential um, leads and investors who might come along at each round. So mm -hmm. even, at seri even at seed round, we're still having conversations with people who might be series A or series B and now we are having conversations with people who are series C or even later even though we might not raise for two, three, four, five years, it's about taking people on that journey and getting them invested emotionally in the highs and lows, celebrating successes, so that by the time you're ready to fundraise, they know who you are, they're already having a positive affinity um, towards you. And so I just, I just think it's too important to leave to chance. Yeah. Like ultimately, you need capital one way or another um, in, in order to be able to grow your business. And in the absence of that, uh, or uh, being um, a self-sustaining, profitable business, you're not going to be able to keep working on your business. So that means we don't leave it to chance and we're always fundraising. Yeah, so you've got a constant pipeline, a system, a funnel, and you're turning cold into warm, into hot, and just doing it, it's just like a sales cycle. I see far too many entrepreneurs who sort of raise at the last minute and then don't really think about it again until they need to raise again. That to me, would that might be perfectly fine for some, but for us, we would find that incredibly stressful. Yeah. You know, we're parents, you know, We've, it's just that's that's the, it's enough of a roller coaster anyway. Yeah. So trying to minimize it by sort of planning it planning it ahead as much as you possibly can, I think, um, can just bring a little bit more peace of mind to the process. Sure. You, you talked about your co-founder a few times. Then mm -hmm. um, a lot of 
uh, investors won't even invest in a business if it doesn't have a co-founder. They think it's quite quite important. Um, what YC, for example, um, have that rule. Um, how do you find a good co-founder? Because I understand you knew each other for a long, long time beforehand. It was many, many years before you actually started to work together. But how, how does one find a co-founder? I mean, I, I don't actually know. I guess that you could... Um, I'm sure that there are lots of matchmaking services out there, whether they're different types of accelerators or there's meetups or... So yours was just by chance then? No, um, T Tessa, my co-founder, and I went to business school together okay, and so we stayed like, good friends. Yeah, yeah. Um, and before Olio, we had, um, we just often talked about and brainstormed about different entrepreneurial ideas. And there's something that we tried to get off the ground when we were both on maternity leave a few years ago and then we went our separate ways. Um, and then we came back together um, on Olio. I mean, I don't know how you find a co-founder. I do believe that it's incredibly important. Mm. Um, it's, um, I would don't envy solo co-founders, that's for sure, unless maybe they're subject matter experts and they're on their second or third iteration of something that they know really well. They don't need that, um, that, that work wife or husband to, to go along the journey with them. Sure. Um, I definitely think it's not something you should compromise on. Um, and you probably treat it the same way you would dating, mm. except in a professional context. So you need to meet a lot of people, you need to talk about values, you need to make sure that the, everyone's fully aligned. Um, and then, you know, don't walk down the aisle until you're really sure that you're ready to make a commitment. Yeah. Um, but but uh, I don't exactly know how to go about finding one. Okay, fair enough. Uh, the, the previous business, was this my crash? Yes. Okay, so prior to Olio, you, you had founded my crash. Um, what are you doing differently as a like a second time, third time founder as opposed to a first time founder? Because I, I find that people that are on their second or third business, they've forgotten more than the first person has learned, if, if that makes sense. Um, so what, what are you doing differently this time around? My, my crash was a small local business um, and it certainly met a need I had at the time, which was um, a, just a shortage personally as an expat in London. I didn't, um, I found myself not having access to childcare because I didn't have family around. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I did have, that, you know, that was a business that actually had a physical presence on the high street and it was an asset utilization model. So really, um, I looked at that and I thought, this is super interesting and I could scale it, but it's always going to be challenged mm -hmm. um, from an economic perspective because your upside's capped, but your downside is pretty much unlimited to based yeah. on, yeah. depending on how, um, how full your business is. And I wanted to do something that was a bit basically the flip. Yeah. So, um, Olio, you know, we have we, we've obviously have significant expense in maintaining the platform, and all of our sort of food safety rules and procedures and all of that. But now we have um, a fixed asset base that basically has very minimal marginal cost yeah. to to scaling. And to me, that's super exciting. Um, that like level of ambition. So the the difference I think is more just in terms of level of ambition. And also, who you can bring on the journey, you're, going, you're bringing on very different types of talent um, into the two different businesses. Um, and like looking at sort of a childcare business, it is a different profile of sort of employee and team member versus a technology business with global uh, potential. Actually, there's some really smart, motivated, inspiring people in both. Yeah. But I'm personally really enjoying the journey with the team members and the ambition level yeah. of the second. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. You've talked about how big the problem is a few times there. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if food waste itself was a country, I've heard you say it would be the third largest emitter of carbon emissions after the US and China. Yes. Which is like insane, right? It is. So like if you are... More than India then. More than India. Wow. Well, wow. so if, if you're able to solve this problem, mm. I mean, it, it could literally help change the world. I mean, it's, it's a massive, massive, massive issue. A lot yeah. of people talk about changing the world mm. and then they build some API for a bank or something, mm -hmm. you know, which is cool. It has its place, but you actually have a real big problem ahead of you, which you've got a really good solution to, to help, you know, yeah. attack and, and have a go at. So why is this problem important to you, though? You, you talked about... Um, this being part of your upbringing to, to a degree. Is, is that what's driven this or what, where do you think the motivation comes from? Less my upbringing, although I think that probably made me aware um, of, of the opportunity to be solved or just sort of more sensitive to the waste levels. Um, for me, you know, as a parent, um, as someone who really cares about this planet, just looking at, um, at, the, at this century, we've got a population that's going to get to 10 billion by 2050, 
Um, we're wasting 40% 40 40 of the food we produce. It's never eaten. And we have almost a billion people going hungry every single day. 40% is wasted? Yes. That's crazy. And so, which is why it account, why it's such a big con contributor to um, global carbon emissions or greenhouse gas emissions. So it's a, it's a problem that needs to be addressed and solved in our lifetime or we're going to have um, even more people going without food. And because, the, you know, because of the climate crisis, we have more instability when it comes to food production. So food security, even in terms of ensuring we have the crops to feed the people um, that are already alive today, not to mention with the growing population, is increasingly coming under pressure. So, um, but it's, in a, it's, it's a really stupid problem because we have more than enough food to feed everyone. And I'm, I'm not talking about like sort of um, banana skins and eggshells. Like we have legitimately multiple times over more calories yeah, yeah. available to feed everyone on the planet and everyone who's expected to join the planet in the next 20 years. So I, I, it really appeals to the, I guess, the problem solver economist in me in that it's just simply an inefficiency. It's a market mm -hmm. inefficiency. Um, and like, it's quite nice to work on a problem that's not only meaningful um, and affects large, num large, number, large numbers of people, but has a solution. Yeah. It has a solution, and it's a pretty straightforward solution, and technology can help us overcome it. So it's very sort of quite satisfying. It's also, on the flip side, extraordinarily frustrating yeah. um, to see how, how slow progress is. Um, but, but yeah, I th that's why it's important to me. There's, um, there's a lot of big problems out there in the world um, with regard to, you know, I don't need to go through them all, but they don't necessarily have... It's not necessarily sort of clear how we might be able to solve it. This is pretty clear. We like there is a global blueprint. There's global ambition levels to have food waste by 2030 and even take further steps beyond that. And I and I think we'll get there. So it's exciting to be part of part of that. This is a quick message to tell you about Alpha University. Alpha University is an advanced training program to help you reach success in seven simple steps. I am going to personally coach you so that you can achieve your goals, make more money, and transform your life. Just go to joinalphauniversity.com now, or click the link in the description. And the exciting thing is when you're doing it on scale, it can have a massive, massive impact, and a, a yeah. measurable, quantifiable impact on, on how yeah. much uh, positivity and value you're putting into the world and, and helping yeah. people. Um, and when, when you do it at scale, it, it can take a while to get going, but eventually when you hit that exponential growth, it can be really, really rewarding. So, for example, during the first five months of COVID, you saw more usage on your app than the previous five years of the business. We did, yes. Yeah. So yeah. That was quite a turning point for us. Why, why, why do you think that exponential growth started to happen? I think it's, it was a combination of, you can share food, and 80% of what's on Olio is food, um, and we also work with businesses to rescue unsold food. And we do about, last year we did about 30 million meals. This year we'll do about double. But you can also give away any food, um, like you said, when you were talking about decluttering or moving house. Yeah. Um, so we had a lot of people sitting at home um, surrounded by clutter, <laughs> bored, um, and um, in real recognition of the fact that they might have neighbors who are going without or struggling for basic essentials. So there was an outpouring of, I think, just goodwill and generosity and people sort of desperate to connect. Yeah, yeah. And sharing was um, a way to do that. Also, all of our volunteers um, were classified as essential workers. We've got over 100,000 volunteers. And so they could carry out their volunteering. We had a lot of people who were like, wait a minute, so I can leave my house? I can sign up to be a volunteer and I've got legitimate reason to like leave my house and interact with other humans in Perfect. a safe way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and people really wanted to do that because they were desperate to, to, to get out, to connect with, again, to connect with other people. And then on top of that, you know, it started to be the beginning of a massive cost of living crisis, um, supply chain shocks as well. Um, and, you know, because there were shortages of different ingredients. But also we saw a lot of supermarkets at that time come under pressure to not throw away perfectly good food. And so there was um, a real um, sort of uptick in terms of those stores who were participating in our sort of Food Waste Heroes program, which is the collection redistribution of surplus food. Okay. So all of those things together meant that, um, and we got tons of press as well, I should also yeah. say. So all of that together came, just really amplified our message and we reached a lot of people and you know everyone sort of showed up at the party at the same time. Um, since then, we've probably, I don't know off the top of my head, but we've probably five, 
10 X or something, you know, we have continued to grow, but we've never seen that level yeah. of exponential <laughs> yeah. growth yeah. Yeah. begin. Um, our, ma our main challenge really is trying, to, we're, not, we're not pouring money, we're spending hardly any money in marketing right now. We still have massive organic um, acquisition every month, between 70 and 80,000 people sign up every month organically. Um, but we're still we're very much UK focused right now, so we're getting to, I would say, uh, sort of almost mainstream adoption in the UK. Um, but to have the impact that we want to have at a global level, we need to go international. And we're exploring lots of different avenues in order to think about what the best market entry approach is, and it's just not clear right now. So um, stay tuned. Yes. Okay. Let's finish with, I guess, looking into the future, because um, I'm really optimistic when I see. Uh, people like you building products that really create positive change in the world mm. and it's hard to stay positive though when there's war and and as you mentioned the the facts and the statistics around food waste and the climate crisis and everything um, that connects together I guess when you see all of that happening mm. are you generally still optimistic about what you're building or, or is it hard to be and you can be pessimistic like how, how do you see the future you're, you're the one working in this industry so mm. are you generally more I guess optimistic or pessimistic about what, the future of the climate by definition I'm optimistic it doesn't mean that I don't allow myself pessimistic days that are, can be incredibly frustrating yeah. especially yeah when you just have a bad news day sure. um, but um, it, as someone who's been working in this space for 10 years, and I, I think my co-founder and I always felt almost that we were a bit early to market, um, as we're getting close, it now starts to feel genuinely like there's some momentum around businesses specifically and also some governments getting really serious about, ab about plans and systematic change. Mm. Um, and I think a lot of that is lining up with the 2030 UN Sustainable Development Goals, which felt like they were forever away for the longest time. Now 2025 is just around the corner. All of a sudden, 2030 is starting to feel pretty close. Mm. And I, I think that that's gonna, in the next five years, we're gonna see a real rush to enact and put in place um, big, bold changes to at least get us slightly you know, back on track to achieving those um, collective goals that we've sort of set, you know, as as humanity. Um, on an if I so I, I am actually feeling quite encouraged about all of that. I can get quite discouraged sometimes at an individual level. Um, on the one hand, every single change, you know, I just saw a sign this morning at at, um, at a zero waste store, and it said it's just a plastic bag until there's billions of them. Mm -hmm. And um, and and on the one hand, every plastic bag that you know we're not using. Um, is less pollution in our natural environment and it does add up at scale. But on the other hand, um, there's so many conflicting concerns that people have, whether they're thinking about like education or the healthcare system or um, for many people, immigration is a concern, not for me, but for many people, you know, they have got these big concerns and the climate doesn't always even make top 10 for a lot of people. And so until we get the basics sorted where people feel like they've got access to uh, they can afford and have access to basic human human rights and needs like education and healthcare and and shelter. Like it's going to be really hard for um, climate to be a top priority, and so that's that's what causes me a bit of concern. Is I don't necessarily see how in the immediate term we're going to solve that mm. such that we can really be prioritizing climate um, at scale. So course, that said, yeah. yeah. Everyone's responsible for their own individual actions, and there's no reason that everyone sure. can't every day choose to take positive action, which will collectively at scale result in transformational change. So like cautiously optimistic, I guess. Cautiously optimistic today. Yeah, you could yeah. ask me tomorrow, it could be different. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, for people that have enjoyed this and they want to download the app, they want to you know, help and, and share and, and give, um, I've used it, it's great, I'd recommend it. Um, what, what do they search, where, where do they go? Uh, well, it's called Olio, O-L-I-O, -O, and um, you can find it in the App Store or Google Play Store, um, or just go to our website, which is olioapp.com, cool. and yeah, download it, give it a go, it's free. And if people want to um, get in touch, LinkedIn probably for you would be the, the best place? Yeah, uh, yep, definitely LinkedIn, it might be a bit slow to respond, but eventually I get through them all, cool. so feel free to reach out. Amazing. All right, Sasha, thank you. Thank you so much. Hey, thanks for watching this podcast. Make sure that you like, subscribe, follow, comment, etc., etc. And I'll see you in the next episode.